Her father grew up in Green Bank on the Mullica River and taught her to love its plants and wildlife when she was a child. Her father's Dutch ancestors settled in the Pine Barrens long before the Revolutionary War, and most of them are buried in small churchyards near the Mullica River. Elaine wasn't interested in the Pine Barrens history until recently, she tells me, uh, and that's when she began to read about it. She's going to share some of what she learned. She hopes she'll be, you'll be inspired to explore the area if you haven't done so already. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, I have one more line here, and the title, that's an important piece of information. The, pine, the title is The Pine Barrens, Sand, Iron, Pirates, Early Life Along the Mullica River. Let's welcome Elaine. <laughs> whatsoever in the history. 20 years ago, I got a book this big. It was 900 pages, 8 and a half by 11. And with COVID, I got to read it finally. All these years I've had it. And I learned so much. And that's why I decided to do this, because it was fascinating. And it's, as I said, my father was from that area. And uh, I learned about the floor and fauna from him, but never about the history. So I'm going to... I want you to bear with me. I might pronounce some words wrong because some of them are Lenny Lenape terms and I don't know how they pronounce them, so I'm going to do my best on that. Pine Barrens, is that coming up on there? Sand Iron Barrens. Okay. In 1524, the ship of Giovanni Verrazzano dropped anchor in Great Bay, naming the land Nova Cesarea, or New Jersey. Nearly a century later, in June 1614, Dutch Captain Cornelius May sailed south from New Amsterdam to explore the seacoast. He entered the mouths of two rivers, plowed on the banks of each were thousands of birds' eggs, and May named the rivers the Little Egg Harbor River and the Great Egg Harbor River. The Little Egg Harbor area runs about 25 miles along the seacoast from Barnica Inlet to Brigantine Inlet and about 25 miles inland. The Little Egg Harbor River, called Amentok by the native Lenny Lenape, was eventually named after Eric Mullica from Finland. In the winter of 1697, Eric settled with his family in Tokokan, now called Lower Bank. Later, Eric and his sons purchased land in Gloucester County and named it Mullica Hill. The Mullica River was a hotbed of activity before and during the War of Independence. Congress created the Pinelands National Reserve through the passage of the National Parks and Recreation Act of 1978. It was the first national reserve in the United States, over a million acres. It spans portions of seven counties. It's the largest body of open space in the mid-Atlantic mid seaboard between Richmond and Boston. The reserve is home to dozens of rare plant and animal species and the kirkwood cohancy aquifer system, which contains an estimated 17 trillion gallons of water. The Pine Lands is a unique location of historic villages and berry farms amid the vast oak pine forests, extensive wetlands, and diverse species of plants and animals of the Atlantic Coastal Pine Barrens, ecoregion. It's protected by state and federal legislation through management by local, state, and federal governments and the private sector. The reserve contains Wharton, Brendan Bird, Bass River, and Penn State Forests, and Double Trouble State Park, which provide public recreation facilities. The New Jersey Pine Lands Commission protects the pine lands in a manner that maintains the region's unique ecology while permitting compatible development. Oops, there it goes. Okay. Natural resources, when people first came here, were abundant bog iron, sand, seashells, salt hay, and trees. Towering ancient Atlantic white cedars, members of the cypress family, once crowded the boggy forests. They can grow 80 feet tall with trunks two feet thick. Their wood was prized because their trunks are very straight and strong, perfect for the mass of the numerous sailing ships that were built along the Mullica. Cedar wood is, not re is rut resistant and insects avoid it. There were enormous ancient oaks and pines which were also utilized for building ships. The Mullica River and the Little Egg Harbor teemed with fish and shellfish. Deer, large numbers of bear, panther, foxes, wolves, beaver, and raccoons inhabited the forests. Vast flocks of geese, ducks, and other waterfowl crowded the shoreline. 
About 1679, Captain James Clark of Clark's Landing on the south side of the Molotov made regular voyages to New York with pelts and lumber and brought back cloth, ammunition, and other goods needed by the settlers. As the population grew, all sorts of items arriving, arriving by merchant vessel up and down the coast were transported to Philadelphia via, via wagon roads or by boat on the Delaware River. Pine barrens, wood, and charcoal to keep New York fireplaces burning traveled by ship up the coast. Goods from Europe and the Caribbean, clothing, alcoholic beverages, cloth, and mail were brought to Tuckerton, little sleepy Tuckerton, okay, and from there to Leeds Point on the Oyster Creek, which empties into the Little Egg Harbor. They were transported via horse and wagon over a road to Camden, which is still there as New Jersey Route 561, with various names along its route. The route was originally a Lenny Let It Be Trail, Lana Coning. Settlers called a town along the way Long A Coming, which is now Berlin. I thought that was fascinating. <laughs> Little Lake Harbor was a crossways for Revolutionary wartime traffic between New York, Delaware, and Maryland. The Oyster Creek Inn is at one end of Route 561, and the Delaware River is at the other. That, that road is Haddonfield Berlin Road. It's uh, several other names along the way, but I thought that was very interesting. That same road was the main route between the ocean and Philadelphia at one time. Okay. And that bottom picture is uh, the Oyster Creek Inn, which is one of the best restaurants in New Jersey, in my opinion. Okay. Between 1765 and 1868, there were 30 ironworks between Mount Holly and the Mulligan River. Seven of them in the area of the original Wharton estate. Pine Barron's bog iron was known to be extremely rust resistant, but when iron deposits were discovered in Pennsylvania, close to abundant anthracite coal, the bog iron businesses collapsed. Entrepreneurs then built glass factories and paper mills. All of these mills were powered by water from the Mollica and its tributaries. With the enormous amount of wood required for operating some of these industries, the forests were depleted very quickly. A glass furnace consumed six cords of wood in 24 hours. That's amazing. Six cords of wood, imagine. A new furnace took a month to get hot enough to make glass. Wow. So you can imagine why they were totally depleted. Already declining in the late 19th century, the death knell came for industries in the Pine Barrens when railroads were built, bypassing the Mullica River area. The railroads found it more lucrative to transport passengers to the new resorts at Atlantic City and Cape May. Shipping by water and overland on wagons was no longer economically efficient for transporting goods. The boat building business collapsed. Okay, here we go. When Europeans arrived, they first cut down the bounty of trees and built sawmills. The world needed lumber for the burgeoning housing industry and to heat their homes. When they discovered bog iron and built then they discovered bog iron and built furnaces to turn the iron into pigs. I always wondered what a pig was, and that's what it is up that top thing. It's just a bar of iron. Okay. Pigs were transported to forges and foundries where they were first made into iron bars, then hammered or rolled them into usable items, nails, rods, wagon tires, kettles, tableware, and implements. Bog iron is created through a chemical action between decayed vegetable matter and soluble iron in the stream beds. Iron oxide deposits build up, some mix with mud and harden into thick rocky ore beds. If allowed to, bog iron renews itself every 20 years. When the iron furnaces were going full blast, which meant around the clock, the bog iron resource was not given time to renew itself. If you visit the Pine Barrens today, you will find charming, sleepy little villages inhabited by many descendants of the original residents. The beautiful Mullica River flows through what once was a thriving industrial area. It's hard to believe it was home to numerous shipyards, sawmills, grist mills, iron furnaces, forges, glass factories, and paper making operations. It was a notorious center for pirates and privateers before and during the Revolutionary War. In 1766, Charles Reed, a lawyer and New Jersey Supreme Court Justice from Burlington, with several partners, built an iron furnace at a place called Batstow on the north side of the river. It was sold to several partners, including Colonel John Cox of Philadelphia in 1770. Cox took full ownership in September 1773. Pig iron created the furnace was transported to Atsine, where the forge turned it into bars. 
On June 7, 1775, an ad in the Pennsylvania Gazette noted numerous items manufactured at Bastow, including iron pots, kettles, Dutch ovens, oval fish kettles, skillets of different sizes, stoves, rag wheel irons for sawmills, pestles and mortars, sash weights, and forge hammers. The ornamental iron fence that encased the grounds behind Independence Hall was created at Batstow. Batstow produced firebacks for fireplaces and was a major source of miles of iron pipe for water and gas mains in East Coast cities. The steam cylinder for John Fitch's fourth steamboat was made at Batstow. During the tumultuous years before the signing of the Declaration of Independence, Owner Cox was a member of the first Committee of Correspondence and the Council of Safety in Philadelphia. He was chosen mayor of the 2nd Battalion and later lieutenant colonel. By the time of the Revolution, Batstow was an important iron center and was geared to the war effort, manufacturing cannonballs, camp kettles, shell, and grape shot. In March 1778, Congress appointed Batstow's owner, Lieutenant Colonel Cox, Assistant Quartermaster General. Batstow was so important to the war effort that laborers, colliers, nailers, and forgers were exempt from military service. Some were paid for cutting pine and maple. Cox's friend, Colonel William Richards, who had visited Batstow earlier and served under George Washington at Valley Forge, bought Batstow in 1784. After his death in 1823, his son Jesse took over the operation. In 1876, during foreclosure proceedings, Joseph Wharton bought the estate for $14,500. It was a real estate, imagine. <laughs> Wharton planned to raise sugar beets and to sell Philadelphia the clean water that was abundant in the Pine Barrens. New Jersey put a stop to that. Wharton began raising cattle on the grounds and added Victorian features to the mansion. The mansion is a series of houses added to each other, beginning with what appears to be the pre-revolutionary war home of the original Iron Master. In the mid-19th into the 20th century, huge schools of Menhaden were harvested and sent to fish factories and turned into oil and glue off the coast. Many of the fish factories up and down the East Coast were owned by Joseph Wharton of Batstow, the Wharton Tract, and the Wharton School at the University of Pennsylvania. Laborers in those days lived in workers' housing on their respective plantations. Their pay was in whatever they could buy at the company store, the only store available. There were no schools for the poor until the mid-1800s. Prior to that, if workers' children had any education at all, it was from the company clerk. Most of them were illiterate. Very few people had any education. In addition to regular workers, indentured Europeans and Africans, as well as enslaved Africans, worked in the early iron and other industry, industries and as household help. Alcohol was liberally consumed, and there are many written records of drunken workers causing problems. Many indentured workers and enslaved Africans tried to escape. The Richards men were large, strong, and imposing. William was six feet four inches tall and robust. Jesse weighed nearly 300 pounds in his later years. The War of 1812 had been a boon for the iron industry, but after that war, Bastow's iron business faltered. Frequent fires and rebuilding of the furnaces and other properties took a heavy toll as well. The bog beds had been depleted, and Jesse Richards began importing raw material from other states. To keep business going, Jesse established a glassworks and was able to keep the industry alive until he died in the summer of 1854. He is buried at Pleasantville Cemetery. After his death, it was revealed that there was little left of the estate, that his debts would wipe out the rest. With plenty of sand and wood available, during the 19th century after the ironworks failed, there were glassworks throughout the Pine Barrens. In Crowley Town, Green Bank, Batstow, Herman, Nesco, and Bulltown, Window glass panes called lights and trapezoidal panes for municipal street lights were among the main products created by the early glass factories. But jars and bottles were also blown there. Glass from the Pine Barrens oops, had a greenish color because of the iron in the sand. There were numerous paper mills too that made a low grade of paper, often called butcher paper, that always had a yellow tinge because of the cedar water used in the process. In 1707, the first white settlers arrived in Nescochek, that's another one I don't know how to pronounce, later named Pleasant Mills. The friendly Lenny Lenape who lived there were eventually diverted to a reservation in what is now Indian Mills. 
The first European settlers in the area were Dutch, Scottish, French Huguenot, Finnish, and Swedish. There was evidence of a French stronghold at Leeds Point by 1740. They were followed by British and German immigrants who brought their religions with them. <clears throat> Most of the early residents were members of the Society of Friends or Presbyterians, followed by Baptists and Catholics. Presbyterians were worshiping at Clark's Meeting House near Port Republic in 1762. Where the Batstow and Molucca rivers merge, an area known as the Forks, there has been a sawmill, a cotton factory, and in 1861, the paper mill was established. It made a sort of rough craft paper from marsh grass, salt hay, and other materials, brought, brought up the Molucca from the Philippines, England, and Germany, and India. Aside from Batstow, all that's left at the Forks is the Methodist Church with its cemetery, the Kate Aylesford Mansion, and the empty paper mill. Charles Peterson wrote a romantic novel, Kate Aylesford, that was very popular in its day. It's supposedly the setting of this Elijah Clark house was the setting for the Kate Aylesford uh, novel, which is, sounds like a really silly novel, by the way. Very typical of that period. Okay. The Forks. This picture of the it's as close as I could get to the forks. <laughs> so it's sort of the forks. It's not accurate. And, this, and the boats was something. I couldn't find any good pictures of old boats either, so that's not it either. But just downstream from the area where Basto and Pleasant Mills are located is the forks. In revolutionary days, there were houses, inns, barns, and wharves along the shore. And in the river were hundreds of ships, privateers, and their prizes. Courts of Admiralty held auctions there for the disposition of numerous captured ships and their cargoes. Many shipyards were there. Vessels were built and loaded out to the West Indies, New York, Philadelphia, and the southern and eastern cities, receiving their supplies of shingles, boards, and iron. The inlet was formerly the best on the East Coast, and many vessels destined for Philadelphia in the winter. Because of ice on the Delaware, sailed into the Mollica and there sold their cargoes to tradesmen from New York and Philadelphia. Early travelers through the Pine Barrens were on their own. The roads were not much more than trails. The Wading River used to really, people had to wade on it. That's why it's called the Wading River, where they would wade across. Okay, the roads were not much more than trails. Streams had to be forded. People and horses waded or swam across. Bridges were eventually built, mostly by local residents. In 1773, one of the first taverns in the Pine Barrens was built at a crossroads on the route from Mount Holly and Tabernacle to Little Egg Harbor by Nicholas Suey and his wife, Sarah Sears. Sarah's father, Colonel Paul Sears, served under George Washington in the Continental Army. Suey's Inn became a gathering place for rebel patriots and for training militiamen for both the Revolution and the War of 1812. After the war, Suey renamed it the Washington Inn. By 1795, there was a lot of stagecoach traffic through the Pine Barrens, and there arose a need for more taverns along the busy routes. Traveling less than five miles an hour, every few miles, horses had to be changed, and travelers needed to be refreshed, fed, and perhaps bedded down for the night. Fermented apple cider, known as Jersey Lightning, was served along with beer, wine, rum, and whatever other alcohol could be acquired. Stage taverns were limited by law to be a half day's journey apart. Taverns grew up along all the major routes. Establishments like the Bass River Tavern and Bodines, along with the Washington Tavern, became central to community living, with town meetings, voting, re recruiting for the armed forces, and other gatherings held routinely. The original residents were enthusiastic patrons of the many taverns that proliferated throughout the Pine Barrens. Itinerant preachers rode the circuit on horseback, staying with kindly neighbors when many kindly neighbors. When many residents became Methodists, the party was over. The first Methodist societies <laughs> were incorporated in the early 1800s. Fiery preachers campaigned against liquor and succeeded in closing down most of the bars and gin mills. That's fascinating, too. Okay. Some residents of the Pine Barrens held Africans in bondage. It's said that at least one man, Captain, James, Captain Charles Loveland, was a slave trader transporting human cargo from New Guinea to the American colonies. Many free black people worked in the furnaces and other industries and lived in plantation housing along with other workers. David Maps was a highly respected black landowner. This surprised me, okay. In 1790, he purchased 40 acres in Lower Bank in an area known as the island and employed black laborers to work on his farm. He was highly respected as a farmer and was known to be of strong character and an ethical businessman. 
He purchased a 60-ton schooner and became captain with an all-black crew. He and his wife were Quakers, accepted as members of the Egg Harbor meeting in 1799. Maps built a school and a meeting house. This is the one, the building that he built, for the use of his neighbors and traveling friends, which became the Lower Bank Methodist Church, now replaced by a more modern church on a different site. Captain Hugh Suey, employed by the Dutch West India Trading Company, moved to the area with his wife and children soon after his friend Eric Mollica settled there, around 1700. Hugh's wife was Sarah Van Tienhoven, granddaughter of the notorious Cornelius Van Tienhoven, colonial secretary, mayor and treasurer of New Amsterdam under Governor Peter Stuyvesant. Hugh Suey's grandson, Hugh, also known as Joseph Suey, was captain of the schooner Prosperity and received a letter of mark to plunder British ships during the Revolution. On Suey's land in Lower Bank, his friend John Cavalier built boats George Washington used to cross the Delaware River. They were built in Lower Bank by the Cavaliers. In his book, Jer Jersey Genesis, Henry Carlton Beck quoted John Watson, the river there used to be filled with massive vessels. It was a place rich in money. Hundreds of men were engaged in the swamps cutting cedar. Sawmills were numerous and always in business, cutting cedar and pine boards. Many shipyards were there. Vessels were built and loaded out to the West Indies. Hearing this, a modern pacemaker boat builder, Charlie Leake, commented, generations in the shipbuilding trade, when people hear that, they say there must be money in it. I tell them there is. The money's all in it. Nobody ever took the money out. <laughs> okay. Charlie Leake's family still owns the boat yard in Lower Bank. That's where this, this plaque is. It's in, uh, in front of the um, pacemaker plant in Lower Bank, which became pacemaker and ocean yachts, building pleasure boats. Just one other boat yard remains on the Mullock at Valhalla Boat Works, which is a subsidiary of Viking yachts. A privateer was an armed vessel or skipper commissioned by a belligerent government to commit acts of warfare on vessels of the enemy. A pirate was one who committed robbery on the high seas or on land through descent from the sea without any authority. During the revolution, many privateers had letters of mark giving them permission to prey on British ships. <coughs> Joseph Seward was one of them. With, with letters of mark in hand, privateers attacked and captured cargo from numerous vessels along the coast. Many also did the same without permission, and in fact, on occasion, when a vessel found itself beached, local farmers and tradesmen went out and looted what they could. You've always had people like that, and some of them are probably my ancestors, I'm sorry to say. <laughs> <laughs> okay, here we go. Okay. During the War for Independence, it's estimated that about one-third of the population was rebels, one-third Tories loyal to England, and one-third indifferent to the war or its outcome. Many residents of the Pine Barrens were from seafaring families. Before the Revolutionary War, the Malkin River and shoal-filled Little Lake Harbor became refuges for numerous resident pirates and privateers who preyed upon the many merchant ships from the West Indies and Europe that sailed along the coast. Pirates indulged in bloodshed and murder, while privateers were after booty and avoided bloodshed. Most privateers were otherwise farmers, carpenters, ironmongers, or fishermen. This is just one example of hundreds. On September 28, 1778, the Venus of London was captured by privateers in Little Lake Harbor. Booty consisted of salt, tobacco, cloth, stockings, shoes, medicines, books, hardware, meat, butter, cheese, porter, silver jewelry, knives, and forks, watches, watchmakers, tools, and a vast assortment of other merchandise. The Venus was sold, it was sold, and so was her anchor. It was dismantled and sold. The privateers' swift brigantines and sloops lay in wait for heavily laden ships that foundered on the many sandbars and shoals that formed near the edge of the bay and the island of Brigantine. Many of the locals earned a substantial living selling goods commandeered from those ships, transporting them up the Mullica and by wagon overland to Egg Harbor City, Hamilton, Berlin, Camden, and Philadelphia. The village of Chestnut Neck near the mouth of the Mullica developed to accommodate shipping in and out of the Great Bay, and by 1778 was claimed to be the second largest village on the seacoast between, this is really hard to believe, the second largest village on the seacoast between Sandy Hook and Cape May was Chestnut Neck. Okay. Ships from New York made regular stops there, taking out cargoes of lumber, fish, furs, and produce, returning with mail and provisions. Hundreds of sailing vessels were built along the Mullica at Lower Bank, Green Bank, Clark's Landing, Weekstown, Crowley Town, and beyond. 
The most popular privateering ships were the Brigantine and the Sloop. Okay. To quote from the book, A Nest of Re Rebel Pirates, on March 8, 1778, the British Secretary of State for the Colonies sent General Clinton a note telling him to take troops to destroy all ships and other property along shore whenever practicable, so as to incapacitate the rebels from raising a marine or continuing their depredations upon the trade of this kingdom. With the capture of the Venus of London, which I mentioned a, a, a little earlier, Sir Henry Clinton reached the limit of his patience. On October 6, 1778, a British expeditionary force destroyed the village of Chestnut Neck. The main objective of the expedition was to destroy the ironworks at Bastow, 13 miles upriver, where armaments and other equipment were being manufactured for General Washington's forces and to release British merchant ships captured by rebel privateers at the forts. Among those captured ships was the Charming Nancy, which held cargo that belonged in part to General Benedict Arnold. Arnold used army wagoneers and 12 wagons to race to the forks to unload the Charming Nancy's cargo and transport it to safety. Pennsylvania authorities called for a court-martial, but Arnold, who had been wounded at Saratoga, received only a rebuke from General Washington. Big mistake. Yeah. <laughs> okay. The 10-ship expeditionary force was led by Commander Henry Collins on the HMS Zebra, a three-masted naval sloop. Chosen to command the troops was Captain Patrick Ferguson. Collins and Ferguson were aided by a Hessian turncoat. Lieutenant Carl Juliet had deserted the British, joined the rebels, then approached the British with information about Pulaski's troops, saying Pulaski had vowed to give no quarter should there be a confrontation. Juliet had a special grudge against his former commander, Major General von Bose, a German who had chosen to side with the rebels. Von Bose was an excellent leader who spotted Juliet's lying and lack of character and had placed him under arrest. Juliet escaped, however, with several other turncoats and gave the British details about the Continental troops. The rebels were attacked in their sleep. None survived. Juliet made sure the British went after Von Bose, who was the first person killed, run through multiple times with swords. When the British arrived, they found ten ships, mostly British, including the Venus, that privateers had already looted and begun dismantling. There was a rebel battery set up overlooking the inlet, but there were no cannons in it, though there had, was evidence that eight or ten cannons had been provided. Nobody ever found out what happened to the cannons. But anyway, the privateers had moved their own ships out to sea when they heard the expedition was approaching. The British burned down the entire town of Chestnut Neck and what was left of the ships in the harbor. They realized there was no way to navigate their ships up the shoal-filled Mollica River to Batstow and left before Pulaski's full forces arrived. This next slide, I just found this interesting. This is sphagnum moss. I don't have any, I'll let you read it if you want to. This is one of the, the resources in the Pine Barrens because sphagnum moss was used during World War I as a wound dressing. It's very absorbent and there's only one kind of fat sphagnum moss that will do this and it's down in the, in the Pine Barrens. So I thought this was just fascinating. I stuck it in there because it's one of the things unlike all the other things that they do down there. Okay. There is not much you can make a living with down in the pine barrens anymore, but sphagnum moss is one thing and pine cones are another. People collect pine cones and sell them for, you know, flower arrangements, I guess, and sphagnum moss. Okay. I, I, all right. After the massacre and burning of Chestnut, this is just some people that were from the pine barrens that I was not familiar with. After the massacre and burning of Chestnut Neck, Daniel Mathis, an innkeeper there, sifted through the scraps of his destroyed inn and began building a new one he named the Franklin Inn. Young Jonas Miller helped him with his, the rebuilding and fell in love with and married Mathis's daughter. Miller proceeded to build more inns, including Clark's Mill Hotel, Inns of Blue Anchor, Long a Coming, and eventually Cape May's famous Congress Hall. He had helped his father-in-law rebuild a, an inn in uh, Chestnut Neck, but he built Congress Hall. In 1858, in Crowley Town, the 26-year-old John Landis Mason patented threaded airtight screw-top jars made from transparent aqua glass, the Mason jar. Unfortunately for him, he neglected to patent the rubber ring inside the lids necessary to make an airtight seal until 1868. At that point, jars like his were being made everywhere. 
and through many failed businesses, business partnerships and lawsuits, Mason died allegedly penniless in 1902. Born on an iron plantation, Joseph Flayen Freylinger blew glass as a child at Bastow, and he originated in saltwater taffy. <laughs> Kathleen Crowley was a Miss America finalist in 1950, had a film career before returning to her home of Greenback, town Greenback. She went back to Greenback after her film career. I thought that was fascinating to me. My father's cousin, Bruce Suey, who is now 105, spent his working life in the Army Air Force and became a test pilot. He used to buzz the town of Greenbank in small planes to the delight of the residents. <laughs> he, he's one of my favorite people. He's about five feet two, two and he's a, fit as a fiddle at 105. These are my sources. And the big book, Heart of the Pines, is the one that I just read, and I found it fascinating. And all the information I just gave you, most of it's from here. And that's that. Anybody who's <laughs> Thank you, Elaine. Mm -hmm. okay. That's very good. Mm -hmm.